Originally, we were going to shoot the entire film in Miami because that's where the story takes place. We scouted locations in Florida, and we were going to shoot the movie in Florida. But then the Cuban community became so outraged at how we were representing them, they basically ran us out of town. There was an element of the Cuban community that were convinced that this was a Castro-financed uh, film, which was obviously not true. I mean, Castro had nothing to do with this film. We were doing a gangster film. We were doing a theatrical film, an operatic theatrical film. Uh, but there were some, some people that, uh, within the Cuban community, a small part of them, that were convinced that we were out to, in fact, hurt their reputation collectively. There were a number of threats made, uh, and we thought that it would be best if we moved the production from Miami to California. We shot it in L.A., we shot it in Santa Barbara, we shot it in New York, and then we went to Florida for, for about, I'd say, we shot two weeks there. And when we went back in, we had all kinds of bodyguards, but we were originally going to shoot the whole movie there. Como se llama? Antonio Montana. And you? What you call yourself? Tony Montana, who was named, by the way, after my star at that time was Joe Montana, because I was a big 49er fan, and I was looking around for a good name. I thought Montana, the mountain, Montana. I think the most stunning thing about Al is his face. He's the kind of guy that can hold the screen with his face. When you start a movie, you sort of want to give the lead character a very impressive entrance. And that face, that character, the crazy shirt he's wearing, the scar, the way he moves, the way he talks. Uh, you just want to really hit them because you're hitting them with something they've never seen before. A lot of this had been reported on the news, but nobody had ever seen it in a movie before. And to see these Cuban gangsters and the way they talked, the way they moved, and he just sort of embodied that in that close-up. It's a very well-written scene by Oliver. I think Brian's ideas on the opening of Scarface uh, were very interesting to me, and it was very, again, against the grain, so to speak. Instead of using these a big wide crane shot or something to introduce the, the character, uh, he introduces him in a close-up, sitting in a chair, and he had the camera roll around him 360 degrees all the way around him. He did the performance to take about maybe five, six takes like that. And they were all close. They were all close, and I thought, what a fascinating thing. In other words, he was introducing that face to the audience. And, in, and the script is so good, you also felt the personality coming out of him. You know, that, uh, that arrogant behavior, that Latin machismo coming out of this, this man with a scar on his face. Where'd you get the beauty scar, tough guy? Eating pussy? How am I gonna get a scar like that eating pussy? I was very worried that it looked phony, it was too big, it was too small, so we did many makeup tests until it came up with something we all sort of liked. I felt this character was good with a knife and had, had fought with a knife. And the scar really came from one of those fights. And I thought it would be interesting if it got through the eyebrow and, and the action pulled my head away and it went down even further into this part of the face. So there's one up here and here. I like the different places because I think it, it was evocative of a chaotic uh, wildness in this guy, that he was all over the place. He had one here and one there, you know. I think Brian has an affinity for doing the, the high crane shots, the straight down shots, the bird's eye view of things. And, and some of the things in Scarface were born out of necessity. For instance, the opening uh, in, internment camp that was uh, under the freeways and so on. Uh, if we had been leveled off, you would have seen that it was Los Angeles and not Miami. And uh, Also, he was giving you that sort of introduction as if you're coming from heaven just to come down and to take a look at these people that are interned. He likes to move the camera a lot, and, um, but he doesn't do it arbitrarily. I don't think he does it just uh, what I call cinematic gymnastics. He does camera moves that are an integral part of the story. Other than the personal events, uh, the wars, the actual drug wars, uh, the actual massacres, the chainsaw massacre, were all based on real incidents, very much so. We. We got a big assist from the U.S. Attorney's Office down there. And they showed us their files, and they showed us their tapes, their videotapes of, of, of crime scenes. All of the violence in this film that didn't happen happened. 
They didn't just kill each other in these drug wars. They literally chopped people up and found them sawed up in a trash can outside a 7-Eleven. So I wanted to establish a level of violence that nobody had ever seen before, because this is a whole different level of mob interaction, uh, not the sort of pleasant shootouts of this godfather or stranglings or people being stabbed in the hand. Uh, now we're into really terrible ways of killing each other. And, and I wanted to get it over early in the movie to set up, say, this is, this is what it is. We're in a whole different world here. The chainsaw scene was based on an event I heard about because I hung out with Miami, County of Miami, and Dade County. And I also hung out with uh, Fort Lauderdale, which had another whole history. So I hung out with three different departments, and the case histories were pretty thick on, uh, on murders. Definitely, the saw had been used. The scene was basically written by Oliver, and I just had to figure out a way of doing it, which, uh, you know, wouldn't turn into the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. That is a uh, vintage uh, De Palma technique, and you can feel it when you're doing it, that uh, he set things up in such a way with such a strong um, visual understanding of what he wanted to do with that and how he wanted to build it. So I just, uh, I just marvel at it. And I, I was in the scene, and I felt as though uh, it was so laid out and so completely mapped out that it, it, uh, it wasn't difficult to do. Yes, thank you. You're welcome. He had a giant crane move that Brian designed from the motel and to see Stephen Bauer playing with a girl in a bathing suit and then back again and building that tension. And that sweeping moves, I call those director's points of view, as if, if I were voyeuristically, if I could do that, I'd fly up and look through the window. I couldn't see. I'd come down and fly down. So to me, that's the feeling that he was giving me. Inside the motel room, Everyone that I meet usually says, my God, that scene where they cut off his arm was terrible. I said, they never, you never see it. You see it off of Puccino's face. You see it off of reactions, but you never see it. I said, that to me is good directing because uh, to leave you with the taste that you've seen something that actually hasn't happened. Well, it was interesting. When Scarface first came out, the, the scene, the shower scene, uh, was picked on by almost every major reviewer in this country uh, as something that was extremely violent, that was, that was disgusting. But if you take a look at that scene very closely, we show nothing. All it is is sound. There's sound and a man's face and blood. But there's nothing that goes on in that scene. You saw nothing. It was, it was something that permeated the audience's imagination, which was brilliant filmmaking. It was, it was uh, I mean, that's probably one of the, the most interesting that Brian ever did. When you do a scene like that, there are props around that you use or don't use. And though we may have had body parts to be hanging, if we shot them, we never used them or we didn't shoot them. But the intention was always uh, suggest what was happening. You could hear it. You, you didn't have to see it. I want to set up the world these guys are in, and once you set up a, a terrifically violent scene early in a movie, you don't really have to do much more after that. I expected Brian to give us his elaborate details of how he wanted the picture to look and what he wanted to work with, and all he said is, John, I want you to give me the most beautiful pictures, and I'm going to put violence inside. The movie was supposed to be shocking. <laughs> It's a sh shocking world, and, uh, and these are like gangsters you've never seen before. Well, it was shot in a, you know, a couple of parts. We hung F. Murray from a crane, basically. But the stuntman, Dick Zyker, had to leap out of the helicopter with a noose around his neck, and it had never been done before. That was a kind of tense day, as I recall. We had a couple of cameras on it, and they, you know, they flew around, and then they literally tossed him out of the plane. And then we, you know, intercut it with, you know, Murray hanging from a crane. I want to do a kind of uh, high-tech, neon, acrylic, vibrant pastels instead of your usual dark film noir, because you looked at South Florida and this is what it was all about. These guys dressed in white, not black. 
Scarfiati came up with the whole great look for the movie, and he was just a genius. The Babylon Club in Scarface, uh, an extraordinary set that Nando Scarfiati designed, and he warned me before I saw the set, and he didn't warn me as much as ask me, he said, do you mind mirrors? And I said, no, I don't mind mirrors. I figured one or two mirrors here. I walk on there and there's 15 panels of mirrors all the way around. And to add to the dilemma, Brian says, I'd like to shoot two and three cameras. So that made it even funnier because I had to check each camera to make sure the mirrors were not reflecting itself or the other camera. And then when it was, they were to be destroyed with gunshot, that we weren't going to get an accidental reflection. Stan Parks and Ken Papio are the mechanical effects men. These guys were in charge of the explosions, the pyrotechnics and all that. They're extremely talented men. And uh, the, the fear that I had, everybody had, that these mirrors exploding so close to Puccino, that, you know, flying glass and so on, because they couldn't really be plastic, see? Because if they were plastic, they wouldn't break. Uh, they had to be plate glass so that they, they would have the implosion. What they did uh, was very, very clever. They were able to more or less implode them so that they could take the, the, pellet, the pellets away from Puccino's face. And then we go on the set. These sets were like, fuck. You know, we'd read it. We'd been reading it for months, you know, and suddenly there it is, you know. They built these things, you know, at Universal, and the sound stage is at Universal. And we'd walk on, it's like, oh, now I know where I am, and like, boom, we were there. Manny, look at this, pelican fly. Come on, pelican. The humor was a part of what I thought right from the start would be necessary in order to, to get this guy so that you could uh, laugh at him also, because if not, it was just going to be a you know, one-way street. Playtime is over, okay? <laughs> That's a Carla. It looks like somebody's nightmare. You needed to find those odd things, those twists, those ironies, to give the character some intelligence too, you know, so that there was, a, there was something else going on also. Otherwise, it would be too blunt and too hard to take, I think. What the fuck was that? What you just did? That's it. That's what you do. That is disgusting. Watch. Ooh, look at that fucking thing. That looks like a lizard. Like a bug coming out of your mouth. Oliver said in the scene, you do this thing, you know, have you ever done that? And I said, do that? And he goes, it's this thing. I saw this guy in Miami do this thing, with, uh, you know, with a tongue. And I, and I said, you, you saw somebody do that? He goes, yeah. And I go, yeah, what? And he probably got slapped. He goes, that's what happens. You get slapped. <laughs> and he goes, yeah, but do it. I mean, like, really do it. Can you do it? And I said, well, I'll practice, you know. And I start doing it, you know, and he goes, oh, you're Manny, Manny, oh, it's perfect, perfect, perfect. Show Brian, show Brian, you know. You know, if I wasn't a nice guy, I'd come on, come on, just to pay for you. Come on. Cause you're trouble like that, come on. Bitch. What I try to tell you? Lesbian. Well, I think it's important to establish that, you know, robbers, they sort of enjoy the money they rob. I mean, you know, they have a good time. The cocaine world is a crazy world. It's not all grim death and murder, I mean, you know, it's fun. The clubs should be fun, the girls should be fun. It's a price to pay for all this, but you gotta show that why they're there. Well, they may be killers, but they're kind of colorful. I thought it should have that, you know, very electric disco sound. That's what they were playing in the clubs. I mean, that's all these people live by. It's a very cocaine sound, you know. Get in one of these places, put down a couple of lines, turn the music up so you can hardly breathe, and party. Tony gets the American dream, but it's hollow because there's nothing going on spiritually. He can't love. He can't love uh, Michelle Pfeiffer. He can't, he can't reach across. He can't connect. I have Nick the pig as a friend. What kind of life is that? All he can love is his sister, his blood, but his, his ability to uh, imagine a form of love outside himself is gone by the materialism that surrounds him, is destroyed by it. Al reminded me always of Humphrey Bogart with that kind of narrow face and those kind of uh, 
nervous eyes of his, and I thought it'd be a great finale for him to be buried in a mound of gold dust or cocaine, you know, like just crash into it. The cocaine that Al snorted was real. <laughs> no, I don't know what Al was snorting to take the truth. I do remember we tried out baby milk, which is dried milk, but there was nothing easy to snort because it would get in your nose and you'd be blowing his nose all the time. But uh, I never snorted, so I can't really attest to what it was. I don't like to give away that secret because it takes away from somebody's belief. You have to have a secret. I mean, that's part of what we do. The ending of the, of, of the Paul Muni Scarface has probably a lot to do with the codes of the time that the bad guy had to uh, repent or to, had to crawl on his knees and to beg and be a coward so that he could be killed or punished. So I think that that was probably dictated the ending of Ben Heck's uh, Scarface. I think it was more interesting to let Al Pacino, uh, Tony Montana, destroy himself bring himself down, which seemed to be the case if you study uh, the history, the, the, the profiles of the drug lords, you will see a pattern. Money and excess and wealth, uh, luxury uh, corrupts far more ruthlessly than war. This is it. That's what it's all about, man. The only memory I have of that is putting myself in a kind of trance trance-like state because I was in a coked up state as the character. So I found myself every day going into this room with all these guns and all this smoke and all this hell actually and I would put myself in some kind of a, a give myself a kind of mantra and just go in, bite the bullet and uh, you know spend the 12, 14 hours there every day, day in, day out, uh, just shooting that sequence. Say hello to my little friend. Once you find that you get into a rhythm, and if you're uh, relaxed when you're doing it, you can take anything. You get zen about it. Because uh, if you, for once, take a look around you, it's, uh, <laughs> it's just unendurable. A lot of times when guns are shooting, you don't see the flash. And when you see a gun shoot, you like to see the flash. And so we rigged up something that synchronized the flashing to the shutter of the camera so that you could see the flashing all the time. Ken Papio and, and uh, Stan designed this synchronization system for the weapons so that the camera shutter is open to see the flame and Pacino can't fire it unless the shutter is open. And it sort of drove Pacino crazy a little bit because he pressed the trigger and it wouldn't fire until the camera was perfectly in sync with his flash. And it got a little testy there because he wanted the freedom of it. Uh, but it worked out very good. These men were very, very talented men. We had a lot of time to shoot there because Al burned himself badly on one of the guns. And so I basically had to shoot like two weeks without Al. So I had a lot of time to shoot the Colombians doing things. I'm trying to think how many cameras we used in Climax. I'm not sure. I think we had, we had one on a crane and we had two down below and a third one. May have been four. Maybe four or five cameras that we had. We had, yes, sir, we had a, a slow motion camera that was prepared to shoot the stuntman as he got hit or Puccino as the squibs were going off. We had one camera in slow motion. We may have had five cameras on that sequence. Steven is a very old friend of mine, came over to the set and thought this was great and said, I got an idea, let's put a camera over here. I said, fantastic. So we stuck a camera, I think it was a low angle camera over on the side and uh, it was used for when uh, the Colombians first come into the uh, house. It probably took um, more than half a day just to line up exactly where the cameras were going to go. And it took two days to get the stunt of the man falling. Um, I say it took two days because it wasn't really working right the first time and he had to hold his breath too when he landed there because Brian wanted to keep shooting for a long time.
I thought it was very important that we dedicate the movie to Howard Hawks and Ben Heck because that was always the inspiration for it. The theme for Tony had to reflect uh, the character and the person of Al Pacino, of course, of the, the character of the movie. And uh, it has to be a little dangerous, a little suspenseful, uh, but a little deep too. And uh, I think it reflects quite well that, that atmosphere which uh, was uh, at that time in, in Miami with all the crime and all that stuff. Giorgio Moroda had done a very good score for Paul Schrader uh, and, uh, in, the, in uh, the American Gigolo. And uh, I liked the sound. And of course, as I went into these clubs where all these guys were hanging out, all they played was this sort of you know, endless disco, coked up music. So that seemed perfect for the score. The theme for the two girls was a little tricky because I wanted to have the same feel for both because Tony is in love with her sister and in love with Elvira. And so the sounds are very similar. The melodies are slightly different, but that was done in purpose so to create a little bit of an ambiguity and, uh, and to show the people that Tony is in love with both. The gentleman that was head of the MPAA at that point uh, had a very strong negative feeling about this film in terms of its violence and in terms of its language. Fuck anything and anyone. Fuck Can fuck you fuck. stop saying fuck all the time? But the language was a big problem to him, and he threatened us. Not only threatened us, but he, he stamped an X rating on this film. We discussed what they thought was bothering them, and then I made an adjustment and I sent it back to them a second time. They gave us an X again. Then I cut it back a third time and they were sort of fixated on how many gun hits were in the clown. And I was thinking, the clown? They're worried about the gun hits in the clown. So this is the third time I sent it back and they still gave us an X. And the studio, of course, was saying to me, solve this, you know, you know we can't release an X movie. But I wasn't gonna cut it anymore. I felt it was against what the material was. I didn't think it was overly violent. I thought it was just showing the world of these people. And I thought it was affecting the dramatic thrust of the movie. So I said, I'm not doing this anymore. I think it's, we're, we're gonna hurt the movie. And then I basically got on the phone and uh, I called some of my reporter friends nobody knew about. And I said, this is an outrage. So there was tremendous amount of articles and I went to arbitration on this, except I went prepared for literally a court case. I brought in three psychiatrists, three experts in this field. I brought in Time Magazine. I brought in the police officer, the head of the Organized Crime Bureau from Miami, in terms of how this would affect children, the fact that it was an anti-drug film and how important it was for it to be made. And we conducted this thing. We conducted this like a trial, and we beat him. We beat them hands down. The vote was 18 to 2 in favor of our getting an R rating. Basically, somebody said, we got to let the world know it's happening. And that's what I think swayed them. And we won. Now, there's something that gets completely confused all the time. Because I cut the picture back three times, everybody assumes they saw the third cut. But I called the head of the studio, and I said, if I have an X on the third version, I have an X on the first version. The initial version, they're all X's. Why don't I just go with the first version? And they said, oh, no, no, you can't do that. And I said, why not? <laughs> an X is an X, isn't it? So, so what the version you see in Scarface is the original version that I cut. It's not changed, it has not been cut back, and that's what we fought over, and that's what we won with. When I first saw the movie, I thought that Brian had achieved that operatic uh, style. I thought it would be controversial, though. I thought that there would be a reaction to it, that it would affect a certain kind of uh, criticism. But it was the movie Brian set out to make.
and I, and I thought he achieved it. And uh, I was pleased. At the first screening, actually, the first screening in New York, Martin Scorsese was sitting in front of me. I was a nervous wreck. And uh, he turned around in the middle of it and he said, he said, they're gonna hate this film, but they're gonna love it too. He said, people are gonna love this. He says, you guys are on, you're right there, you're on, you're dead on. And he says, you're onto something, you know. When I saw the film, I was very proud of it. It was, you know, one of my children. I'd go on the New York subways and I'd hear dialogue from the picture. I knew that it had hit a nerve. When Scarface was reviewed and released, we did very well business-wise, but review-wise, we did terribly. There wasn't a major reviewer in this country, with the exception of Vincent Camby, the New York Times, who thought this wasn't garbage. Now, these same reviewers have pointed to Scarface as the consummate gangster film, as the landmark gangster film. Tony Montana was a product of his time. He came here not to blow up banks and not to go into the cocaine business, but this is what was available to him. Uh, as many, many uh, poor people that come to the States, there's nothing open for them, especially somebody like Tony Montana, who had a bit of a criminal background, and he didn't know where to go. So, like many others, he fell within this criminal group. Uh, but he was a heroic figure. He was a man that had integrity. He was a man that climbed very quickly based upon his intelligence and his toughness to become a king of industry. His industry just happened to be cocaine and was illegal. But he was a dynamic character. He was certainly a, an exciting character. He was a romantic character. He was all the things that a good gangster film should, should be in terms of the leading man. It is one of my, my, my favorite films. I felt that what I started out trying to do with that character, make that character in a way, and this sounds uh, strange, I know, but. I picked the two dimensions, not three dimensions, for this character. This side and that side. And, uh, and I went with, you know, sort of tried to go with the globe, you know, and, and, and say, this is it, this is what you see. And, and, and I, didn't, I didn't try to go into another area with it. And so I felt, in terms of that, I, 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 might, have, uh, I might have succeeded. Then. And I'm you know, very proud of my collaborators. They're all great artists. Oliver and Al, and Michelle, I mean, we could go down the whole list. And Bregman, I mean, Bregman was a really fine producer and held this sort of group together. Um, so in a sort of traditional Hollywood way where you have a great producer and a great actor and a great director and a great screenwriter, I think we made a really great movie. Uh, and everybody, did they best they could in a very kind of very controversial material and um, um, we got our heads handed to us at the time because the movie was you know sort of scandalized everybody but in retrospect when you look it back you say this is really good me i want what's coming to me oh well, what's coming to you Tony? the world she's going and everything in it Oh, man.